right into today's Errol Award, who is the editor of Morales Magazine and Louisiana Life, and also the host of Informed Sources on PBS, of course, the TV here. And I'll turn it over to Errol to introduce Mr. Brink, Mr. Professor Brinkley. Errol? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is one of these things, you know, if you read this whole bio, there'll be times of the end of the panel, okay? Uh, and so, we know that Dr. Brinkley is a close the professor. curtain behind them? Uh, many so. books on, uh, yeah. on many, many topics, uh, including Walter Cronkite, uh, uh, John Kerry, Dean Ashton, uh, Hunter Thompson, uh, Jack Kerouac, and, and more. And of course, his latest book is American Moonshine, which we're going to talk about. Well, I thought it was very clever the festival to schedule this panel in a room that's closest to the moon. Uh, yeah, so, anyway, so, anyway. Uh, anyway. Yeah, that, that wasn't here. Yeah. At least you know. It's okay. The last time. I was able to interview you, it was here at the festival, and we'll talk about your book about Walter Cronkite. And it just uh, occurs to me that uh, Cronkite, in his long career, is famous for two gestures. One, when he had to announce that Kennedy had died, and then also the moment that the man landed on the moon, where he just really kind of expressed himself. Can you talk about that, Springfield? Sure, well, uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for coming this morning. So um, I'm, the reason I wrote a book on Walter Cronkite and have just written American Moonshot about Apollo 11 and particularly John F. Kennedy's crusade to go to the moon, um, it's just boyhood interest. I grew up in Ohio in a town called Perrysburg and just down the road from me was Wapakoneta, Ohio. It was where Neil Armstrong was from. And when I was here in New Orleans, I just started, Stephen Ambrose hired me to take over the Eisenhower Center here, which was pre-World War II Museum. It was just getting launched in the idea. And Ambrose had hired me because I wrote a book called um, German Patriot on James Forrestal, our Secretary of the Navy and Secretary of Defense in World War II, and a book on Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State. A young scholar, two books out, Steve said, I'm retiring, come on, move down here. Um, and I had the temerity to send two signed copies of my book to, uh, by Federal Express or a uh, package mail, post office package, um, to Neil Armstrong in Ohio. <laughs> and I, my note on the, it said, Dear Mr. Armstrong, I'm running the Eisenhower Center at the University of New Orleans. Uh, here are my two books. I grew up down the road from you, would really love to, to interview you um, and give a kind of note. I got back a note from his assistant that said, Mr. Armstrong has received your two books. He will read one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and um, he will, uh, but he's not doing interviews, but if something ever opened up, he will be, stay in touch, but thank you. Kind of a polite blow off. Um, Years later, and I'm talking five years later, um, at I was here in New Orleans. I was with Ann, my wife, who's in the front row. We were we'll turn on the TV, like most of you, and watch 9-11 towers going down. And that tragedy of 9-11, uh, one of the things that crossed my mind uh, selfishly was there goes my Neil Armstrong interview. Because NASA had gotten a hold of me and said on uh, the 13th of um, September, I would be doing the official oral history of Neil Armstrong for NASA. Oh, wow. um, that when Armstrong turned 70, they asked if I would be willing to do the interview. He had remembered my books and my note. And, um, and it was, I was so good, all, and then I said, there it goes, because all airports were shut. And I got a hold of NASA, and I said, oh, what are we gonna do? Can we reschedule, da, da, da. Said, what do you mean reschedule? And I said, well, everything's shut. He said, no, no, Neil Armstrong doesn't cancel. 
And, and he, he said he'll fly. He's going to fly his own plane into Johnson Space Center. So it's like Chuck Yeager out of the right stuff. He came flying in. I was waiting for him. He was piloting there, landed. We came into a little room area like this, and I did a six-hour interview with Neil Armstrong, uh, which is one of the um, um, key things that I use in this book, American Moonshot. Um, but that interest in space has been with me forever, and I do think you're right. Uh, it was Cronkite that got me into it, because we, in those days, must-watch TV, where there was Alan Shepard going up. Uh, I was only one for Shepard and two for Glenn, but my parents were hooked. So by the time of the Apollos, our whole family would just hone in on the TV. And I do think it is, where were you July 20th, 1969, when the Eagle is landed? And on the 21st, Neil Armstrong says, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Um, people that are alive remember where they were. And what's exciting about it, this summer's the 50th anniversary. But what's exciting is, you know, a lot of the events that I deal with, big ones in uh, recent American history, Pearl Harbor, tragedy. Kennedy assassination, which, which Earl mentioned, tragedy. 9-11, I just mentioned, tragedy. Going to the moon was a triumph. And um, Cronkite was the, oh, they started calling him when the Mercury program was on. We had the Mercury seven astronauts of, you know, Glenn and Shepard, Wally Shira, and um, Deke Slayton, and, and Scott Carpenter, Gus Grissom. So they considered him the eighth astronaut they called Cronkite. Because what he did was make it so compelling. Um, um, all of that coverage. And so when that moment turned in, you know, when Armstrong went on the moon, 550 million people watched. 550 million people globally watched. It was a time when the Vietnam War was tearing the country apart, but going to the moon largely brought the country together. And the term moonshot, we all use it now as a, a word, one word for American can-doism and engineering excellence. And we're, all the time I can, I can ask you guys, what's the next moonshot? Joe Biden saying we've got to collectively pull together not to fight cancer. Um, Buzz Aldrin, the astronaut, says the new moon shot is the Mars shot. You know, people are looking for when we can all do it together. And uh, last thing, the term moon shot got popularized in 1959. NASA's created 1958. 59 moon shots popularized pre-Kennedy's speech of 61 because um, a guy named Wally Moon, a baseball player for the Los Angeles Dodgers, would hit towering home runs out of the LA Coliseum, and the radio announcer, Vince Scully, would say, there's a moon shot over the thing, and it was at a time when the, going to the moon was in the mix, too. 1960, Time Magazine picked science as the men of the year, and so this idea of science, jet age, space age, and all started personifying Jack Kennedy's new frontier. I want to get talking about Kennedy, but first, let me just talk about the Neil Armstrong. In the years to follow, uh, I think people thought that the first man to live on the moon would be the most famous person in the world, one of the great celebrities. He never became a celebrity. He wasn't a real personality. Um, in retrospect, would it have been better for the space program to have somebody who would have made the talk shows and going around in public and been uh, like a Buzz Aldrin sort of person, been more of a celebrity? I don't think so. Uh, I think Buzz covers a lot of ground for all of them. Uh, he's very out there. Buzz goes everywhere, TV shows, commercials. Neil Armstrong was a very quiet engineer. Um, he went to Purdue University. He didn't talk a lot. He was, however, I think, I, I never like to say the best, but he very well may have been our best aviator, military naval aviator in the Korean War. He was on 48 combat missions. He went over to China. He was shot down. He is an amazing pilot, incredible engineer, brilliant. Buzz Aldrin's brilliant too. Buzz got his doctorate at MIT, and people don't realize that because he's sort of a, a feisty, punching guy, and you think. But, but um, Armstrong stayed very, um, uh, was cerebral. But the problem we have with my oral history of him is he hated the media. He hated, despised news people. 
Part of it was the fear of his hero, Charles Lindbergh's baby was kidnapped. And he had told me that that became a big thing, that if you get become tabloidized, now your family's gonna be in it, and you're becoming, it, it, it's a chain of ugly events. So he went more of the reclusive route. Uh, but not with a capital R recluse. He would do go to golf tournaments and boards here and there, show up for the uh, engineering conferences. I couldn't call him a recluse, but so when I got that big interview of him, when he turned 70, that was it. He did not like doing interviews. And, and he didn't like romanticizing space because he was mission. And so at one point, I am a humanities person, for, first and foremost, I'm a historian, but I love law, literature. It's why I'm here at this incredible festival. I like uh, poetry and literature. And so at one point, I tried to loosen him up. I did loosen Armstrong up on the Korean War because they're very self-deprecating, but I truly felt I got him talking about those experiences. But when I got to the moon, I at one point said, Mr. Armstrong, give her just go out and look at the moon and think, oh my goodness, I was stood there and I got to see Earth? No. <laughs> He wasn't, he wasn't jerking me along. He just was telling me the dead honest truth. He does not think like that. Um, and a lot of the best thing, to, there's a movie out right now called Apollo 11, which is some of the raw footage with no commentary. It's just a great film if you get a chance to see it, particularly in an IMAX format. But um, the, one of the things that spoke in my book and in that film is at the very end, when the, we retrieved Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong, Mission Control put up on the board John F. Kennedy's May 25th, 1961 pledge that we're gonna put a man on the moon and bring him back alive. They flashed Kennedy, and then, big tribute to Jack Kennedy, underneath it, they said, task accomplished, J you know, July 1969. The point being for NASA people and people in the Defense Department, this was a mission, a Cold War battlefield as surely as Korea and Vietnam beating the Soviet Union to the moon. My book explains why John F. Kennedy put that much money, about 4.4% of our national, um, of our budget went for Apollo. Um, and that's $25 billion at the back then. Today that would be about $185 billion to go to the moon. And um, why did we put all of that um, on the, that much cash and public sentiment on that objective? Um, I want to do, can, one thing about Aldrin, I mean uh, Armstrong, his famous line, one giant step for mankind, from which you say, that doesn't sound like something that he would have coined. Well, was there somebody? Well, it's a good question. He sat, he pondered it. And it is highly unlike him, but he realized that NASA was going to let him say what he wanted. There was no team. He sat up with his brother, and he had jotted down that. And as a, his first, he had a couple, and his brother at a kitchen, little round kitchen table, and he said, "Hey, I'm thinking, brother, about saying this." And his Neil's brother said, oh, "That's so good. <laughs> that would be done." <laughs> Don't think anymore. What could be better? That's perfect line. And uh, and so he held that in. And you know the funny thing is the first real words uttered on space. It's it's a lot of errors in almost every book. Was contact light. Uh, some people think it was the eagle has landed. But first they were doing their their um, some of their business before they then reported the eagle has landed. If you want to be technical about it. Uh, but then Houston or Tranquility Base. You know, in the in the city of Houston, the fact that their name was set by the moon right when we landed is still a big deal. Uh, one of the things I'm writing about too is how this space benefited you guys, because what Jack Kennedy did in by going to the moon, he the FDR had the Grand Coulee Dam and the Tennessee Valley Authority and the WPA bridges and tunnels, all that big infrastructure of the New Deal. Um, Eisenhower built the interstate highway system and the St. Lawrence Seaway connecting the Great Lakes to the Atlantic. Kennedy came in, what's my big thing? And it started by, due to the fact that the Soviets had put Sputnik up in 1957, and who's the head of missile technology and space, 
was mattering, but in the late 50s, we developed the computer, micro the computer chip. And we were starting to be ahead in R&D, and Kennedy decided that the new frontier, which was his new deal in Great Society, was going to be technology. That was going to make America number one in the science technology arena. And in the South, because of integration, post-Brown decision, and Kennedy famously had James Meredith and Little Miss, George Wallace, Alabama, you know all that early 60s stuff. He was worried about losing the South. The South was still Democratic in 1960, 61, and 62. Kennedy won Texas, barely. And now his aggressive Bobby Kennedy Justice Department, Burke Marshall, Southern fighting for civil rights, very well may lose the Democrats to the South. So Kennedy, with Lyndon Johnson, say, we're going to put pork into the South. But good pork, I just mean money. So they built San Antonio become space medicine, Houston, man space. Look at here in New Orleans at your facility. The, the, the slogan went from, um, from muskrats to moonshots here in New Orleans. Um, and the, on the Pearl River with Mississippi, you know, testing of Saturn's, Huntsville, Alabama, where the rockets are built. Central Coast, Florida, money pouring in. Brevard area, North Carolina, money pouring in. Langley in Virginia, money pouring in. Look how much Tulsa became a center because Robert Kerr, the senator from Oklahoma, Lyndon's best buddy, was the head of the Senate um, um, Appropriations Committee on Space. Albert Thomas was the congressman from Houston, a head of congressional space appropriations. So think about the money in building the technology corridors in the South being a big part of what Kennedy was doing. Now, and, and, and incidentally, of that $185 billion of today's money, we got a lot out of it. Things like GPS, um, anti-icing, CAT scans, MRI, kidney dialysis. <coughs> the spin-off technology from the moonshot is really quite extraordinary. Of course, the famous thing is Tang. <laughs> and and tang, tang and Velcro, and one of the things that I looked at with Velcro was not invented by NASA. You know where Velcro came from Switzerland in uh, the, right around World War II as a dogs, uh, mountain alpine dogs would get burrs in their fur, and a guy decided a way to get the burrs out of the work dogs and created Velcro to pull off all of those burrs. Um, but NASA, to their credit, adopted Velcro. So if they didn't invent things, NASA took early things and put them all together. So uh, I think we're a great beneficiary. For, I'm a very pleased that to write about NASA in the 60s because it was a government agency doing their job well. I should mention one other New Orleans connection, though nothing that Kennedy would have calculated, was that the third guy on Apollo 11, Michael Collins, had roots in New Orleans. His dad was from um, Algiers. And he was a, uh, a general. I think he was involved with the planning of, of D-Day, very distinguished uh, general. I don't think Michael Collins himself spent much time with his, uh, uh, like his father did. He had great roots in Algiers. He was born in Rome, Michael Collins, in Italy, because of the military background. But this is as much of a home as he had, or, or I, a family identification as anywhere else until his adult life when he made it a life of his own. I think his dad was involved in naming the beaches in Normandy as well. Um, and he wrote Michael Collins, in case some of you don't remember, all, uh, Aldrin and Armstrong land on the moon, but Collins has to sit in that, in, in, sit in circle the moon waiting to retrieve him, and he wrote in his book about the solitude of that, you know, like, wow. And just seeing lonely, fragile Earth, blue-green ball just floating there, and you're alone in space, and, and uh, he felt it as a spiritual thing. He felt a, a sense of happiness and euphoria, too, but also a strange sense of solitude, as you can imagine. They were a team, just like Ambrose wrote about Band of Brothers. You know, these were those Apollo astronauts, and all of them, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, they really banded together. Armstrong and Aldrin created some bad blood later in life because Armstrong got picked first. It probably should have been Aldrin, but they wanted, Aldrin was active in the military, and because of the Vietnam War, Nixon wanted the first man on space, not just Nixon, but our government, if you like, 
or the first person on space to be a civilian. And Armstrong was a civilian. Because we weren't going to militarize the moon, we were coming in the name of peace, so you couldn't put a soldier on the moon, it had to be somebody not in active military service. But going back to, uh, okay. can I take one last thing? Sure, the go ahead. flag that those guys planted, you know what, it, it, there, you realize all the footprints are there because there's no wind. So we go back to where they were as a, make it as a historic monument. All the footprints, everything would be there with no, there's nothing's been touched, no wind's blown in, except the ultraviolet sun rays have turned the entire flag white. It killed all the red and the, and the blue. It's all faded, so if we went there, we would see the pole with a white flag. Going back to Kennedy's announcement, in 1961, he only been president for a, a few months. Um, was there a lot of preparation for that announcement? I mean, were there like secret meetings between NASA and people in the high government? They just do this more or less spontaneously. Say, Let's do it. Big thing happened was when the Soviets put Sputnik up in 1957, the first satellite, there became a wave of fear that we were losing the Cold War. Um, remember, McCarthyism was in the 50s, anti-communism, and people were wondering why in 19, from 45 to 49, the United States is a nuclear monopoly. Suddenly, starting in 49, they get the atomic bomb, Russia. And they're developing a hydrogen bomb. And they're building all these inner range and intercontinental ballistic missiles. Now they're putting a satellite into space. And then they put a dog into space. And, um, and that we're like, the Democrats say we're losing the Cold War because of Dwight D. Eisenhower. That Eisenhower's golfing and Mr. New Look budget cutting, and that we got to do something to respond to the Soviets. Lyndon Johnson becomes the spur on the creation of NASA. Eisenhower agrees. Ike's view is Ike always calls Kennedy's race to the moon um, a stunt, a grandstanding play and a stunt. So does George Bundy, Kennedy's own national security advisor. Bundy had the temerity to tell the boss, the president, I don't know if any national security person would have the temerity to tell Trump this. <laughs> he goes to Kennedy and says, Mr. President, your whole moonshot thing is a grandstanding ploy. Um, I, I don't, you know, it, it's not fitting of a president. Some national security guy said, and Kennedy got mad and snapped back at me, said, Mac, you don't run for president in your 40s if you don't have moxie. Um, this is Kennedy because Kennedy starts running for president after Sputnik. And his big thing, if you look at Kennedy in 57, 58, 59 as senator, is we are going to, um, that Eisenhower's, we're losing in science, we're losing in space. In the debates of 1960 with Kennedy Nixon, the first presidential debates ever, four of them, um, and they're not, they're not just first televised ever, they were the first presidential debate ever. One of them that's great to watch, Kennedy scores real TV points on Nixon. It says, you talked to Khrushchev to go to the kitchen cabinet debate. You told Khrushchev that your American appliances are better um, than, than uh, Soviet appliances. Well, I don't know about you, Mr. Vice President, but I'll take my TV in black and white I want to be number one in rocket thrust. <laughs> Bing, he scored some debate points on, on Nixon. And then another of the moments in the debate, he says, if we keep up with Eisenhower, Nixon, foreign policy, there is going to be a Soviet flag planted on the moon. I want an American flag planted on the moon. He wins. That's a lot of heated up rhetoric about the moon. And now when he gets inaugurated, Kennedy's starting to hem and haw about it. Like, oh, it's political rhetoric. It's like Trump building the wall or whatever, right? It's like part of it. And, but then the Soviets put up Yuri Gagarin on Kennedy's watch. The first man, person in space is a Soviet. He's only president in a couple months. And then we, he still doesn't know what to do, but we try putting Alan Shepard up. And Shepard not only goes up, he's only in, in space 15 minutes. Up, high space, down. <laughs> But it was covered in massive ratings, and he was treated, Alan Shepard, like a Charles Lindbergh um, um, hero. 
and Kennedy's like, wow, space really is the ticket. If we can keep putting up these astronauts, I get Bonanza TV ratings, and, you know, and I'm a, and I look like I'm the, these are the Kennedy Space Corps, and he then do, leads to Werner von Braun, the former Nazi um, creator of the B-2 bombs that destroyed London. We had smuggled a group of Nazi rocket scientists into America called Operation Paperclip, and first they went to Fort Bliss, Texas, and then they went to Huntsville, Alabama, and at Huntsville, all of these ex-Nazis built the rockets that took us to the moon. Von Braun built the Saturn V that took Armstrong. He was with the SS, and they used Jewish slave labor to build his bomb missiles during World War II. Kennedy first met Von Braun in 1953. Um, Kennedy just won the Senate seat for Massachusetts, and Werner Von Braun uh, was uh, magazines as the genius of the new space world. And um, they were the judges for Time Magazine's Person of the Year. And Kennedy and Von Braun picked Conrad Adenauer, the West German <laughs> Chancellor. And how do you bring West Germany and the NATO and all was in the mix. And I hated Von Braun just because he thought he was a Nazi. Kennedy thought that was 19th century nonsense. Eisenhower was born in the 19th century, Churchill 19th century, De Gaulle 19th century, Khrushchev 19th century, Werner von Braun and Kennedy were contemporaries. Their view was we were grunts in World War II. He worked for Germany because he's German. I had to go to the Solomon Islands because I'm American. The war's over, West Germany's our friend. Von Braun sworn allegiance to the US Army in America. I'm not gonna hold him responsible for World War II. I, held him responsible in a lot of ways, so much so that in the late 50s, Eisenhower gave all the funding for rockets to Navy, Vanguard, not the armies, Nazis, or US armies. Uh, meaning, and meaning uh, Ike had a problem with it, where when Kennedy came in and decided to go to the moon, he, at, when he knew Warner von Braun said, I can do it. Yeah, yeah, yes, we can do it within a decade, and that's what we should do. Otherwise, you're going to incrementally, Soviets do a feat, we do a feat. Bum, 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 bum. And Kennedy, Von Braun, and Lyndon want to leapfrog. Let's go for the whole enchilada, because the Soviets were focusing on one step at a time. We had an advantage by leapfrogging, because on a flat playing field, with, with both equal, the thought was we can beat them to the moon. And um, Kennedy puts all of this money on the, the speech that we're going to do it and um, continues to fund it. It's bipartisan. It's wildly popular. Um, they use the astronauts that go into space as salesmen. Every time Kennedy would brilliantly time with NASA a launch like two days before a, a congressional appropriations. <laughs> you know, like, so now Wally Schraw just goes into space. He's back. Congress, are you going to continue funding the program? <laughs> and they had a great advantage, Kennedy and Lyndon, by telling these senators that the fiscal conservative senators, like Barry Goldwater, did not like to fund it. So Barry Goldwater thought we'd build the Air Force up, that this NASA stuff was a lot of, a lot of, not the way to go. But most Republican senators have said, are you weak on communism? You don't want to beat the Soviets? Well, you work, okay, you don't want to fund NASA, so you don't want to beat the Soviets to the moon? They were all had to say, no, no, I'm going to beat the Soviets. <laughs> so it was a masterful job of Kennedy. And what he was, John F. Kennedy Mazur, a great salesperson. He really could give a speech. His space speeches, including at Rice University, where I teach, is, is incredible. The, um, well, Von Braun, couldn't he have just as easily been tried as a war criminal? Uh, at that period of time. But wasn't part of the mood looking past the Nazis because the greatest fear was the fear of communism? So that kind of trumped the Nazi fear exactly. uh, at that time. That's what it did. The anti Soviet was the new enemy, and mm -hmm. Von Braun was willing to. And look, guys, Werner Von Braun was the Einstein of rocketry. I mean, Hitler wanted to destroy all of, of London with Von Braun's rockets. He was the first one as a German. Um, in World War II to break the 62 miles and put an object into a uh, break Earth's uh, gravity. He's the first person to ever do that, Mom Brown. He sent a rocket into space and during World War II. And then he developed the V-2 rockets, which were supposed to annihilate London, 
problem was they were so hurried up and made in 44 and 45 that many didn't work, but the technology was there. Um, Von Braun got captured by the US Army and um, he ba basically turned himself in, had hidden all of his blueprints, rocket treatment, war materials in a cave, blew up the cave, a secret location, and then they went looking for the US Army, hands up, and said, here's the deal, no war crimes, we'll move to America, Let, let's bring our families, and we'll build the missiles for the, you guys in the United States. And uh, Truman said yes to uh, Operation Paperclip. They did not, Von Braun did not want to go to Russia. He didn't want to live there. And London, he would have been tried for war crimes because he had killed 5,000 civilians with his V2s, and he was trying to destroy, eventually, the whole city of, of London. So he wouldn't have been treated as well in America. We just threw him out into the desert, into New Mexico. White Sands Proving Grounds, near Roswell, where Dr. Goddard, our one real rocketeer, was living. Uh, they put Von Braun near him, and then they started putting missiles up there. And by the time of the Korean War, we weren't using missiles in the Korean War. It wasn't funded. But Korea woke America up to they had to start funding things. I write in my book, Von Braun could be tried for war crimes. The Dora camp, the subcamp of Buchenwald, um, what was happening there at the slave labor camps, just if you know anything about the Holocaust, you can imagine. But, uh, and the amount of deaths, disease, pestilence, it was horrific. Um, but you know, it's a debate whether there's some documents that show he should, or others that so no, he was just following orders. If he didn't, he would have been killed. And so it's a whole subgenre of whether Von Braun should be, be, I say he's not a sustainable hero. If you study engineering, rocket engineering, you have to understand his work. But the idea, like in Huntsville, of the Von Braun Civic Auditorium and all of this, I'm not sure it'll last. <laughs> um, you know, we'll see. Well, the just following order is argument is something you hear in every war. <laughs> so, um, one of the first I want to mention one of the astronauts in the early days, who I think was really probably a really positive force, was John Glenn. Glenn was the clean marine. Uh, you know, another part that for these astronaut corps is all about money, all about funding. Air Force wants the money, Navy wants the money, Army wants the money, and the Marines are saying, what about us? And, you know, well, the Marines aren't doing rocketry, and they're not going to be, they, but they did get Glenn into the game, so we could say that on that key mission, a Marine went around the planet five times. Glenn's was treated with a massive ticker tape parade, bigger than Shepard. And not just that, the Kennedy family globbed on to him. At one meeting with the astronauts in the White House, Kennedy had that bad back with Addison's and he would sit in a rocking chair. So he'd rock and all the astronauts came in for their big like Oval Office powwow. And Kennedy first thing looks them all over and says, now is it true I hear you're all Republicans? <laughs> And they all like looked at each other very nervously, and then um, Gus, and they were, and but Gus, uh, and a couple were, were independents, uh, but Gus Grissom um, broke the awkward moment, and Gus said, oh, oh Mr. President, none of us, we, you don't know us, none of us know what the hell we are. <laughs> and they kind of chuckled, um, but Kennedy globbed on to Glenn, and they basically, JFK said, you're a Democrat. And you know, and you're from Ohio, and we're going to be using you. And Bobby Kennedy became great friends with John Glenn uh, so much so that I interviewed Ethel Kennedy for my book and Bobby Kennedy's wife. And when her husband was killed in Los Angeles, she told me the blood's there, everything going on. They're, she just recognized her husband's dead, and she got on the phone and called John Glenn and said, "We can go stay with my kids at Hickory Hill, her home in Virginia." Um, be, you know, that, to look after them. That's how close Glenn becomes to the Kennedys. And of course, he goes on to become a Democratic senator from Ohio and ran for president in 1984 but didn't get the Democratic nomination. The, uh, in Operation Paperclip, of course, the most famous was Ron Brown, but there were many German scientists who came over because of that. Just in Operation Paperclip alone, there are about 1,300 Nazi uh, scientists, um, 
Um, and there are other operations. There are other, there was one called Operation Nightingale, that uh, Operation Nightingale were Nazis that were Soviet intelligence experts and we wanted them now because of the new Cold War. Paperclip dealt with the technology sector, the German sector really helped push American <coughs> technology forward. The Soviets got quite a bit of German war book bounty too. We did, because we got Von Braun's project, we got the best, we got the golden egg, but they got a lot too. A lot of their rocket um, development was from ex-German rocketeers also. Uh, we were shocked that they were able to gather as much information out of the Eastern sector of Germany as they did, but they found a lot of um, the same equipment. So now we're racing each other for intercontinental ballistic missiles. Cuban Missile Crisis, guys, it's about Jupiter missiles. The US has Jupiter missiles in Turkey pointed at the Soviets. And they don't like, that. And because we're doing that, Khrushchev wants to build them in, in, on his own missiles in Cuba. Those Jupiter missiles were all built by Werner von Braun. The Jupiter was von Braun army missiles, meaning he was designing our war missiles um, and, and the Saturn is just the moon project was from his heart. But he wrote a book about Mars exploration. Von Braun became really dear friends with Walt Disney. Um, Disney would have him on his show. He came cover of all the magazines, Von Braun. You know, um, you know, he Hollywood stars would come to Huntsville just to meet him. He was a handsome man, too. He was handsome, he was debonair, a lot in common with Jack Kennedy. Both were, uh, for lack of a stronger word, playboys. Um, you know, infidelity ran deep in both Von Braun and Kennedy. Um, and so they, they, they had great shorthand. It would anger all of the people at NASA, the bosses. Kennedy would swoop into Huntsville or Cape Canaveral, and he would go hang out with Von Braun. He'd always say, come on, let's, like, you're, because they had shorthand together. They could talk, uh, um, and incidentally, Kennedy, on the time he died, the day before he died, he spoke in San Antonio, and that's when he famously said, there's an Irish story where you throw a cap over a wall. If you have a big brick wall, you take your cap and you throw your hat over at the wall. Now you have no choice but to find a way over the wall to go get your hat. He said that, and said, that's the move. We're here committed. We don't have, may not have the technology, but we have to find it. Um, and then he um, went to Houston where he gave a, a, a gala dinner talk for Albert Thomas, the congressman who brought all that pork in Houston. 1962, the Astros baseball team is created. Um, they get the rockets for the NBA. It becomes Space City, USA, Houston. All of this money, Boeing, and all these people pouring money into the city of Houston. And uh, Kennedy, Albert Thomas is the congressman who got all the money there. And at the big thing, Kennedy slips up. He says, due to Albert Thomas, you, we now, you, you in Houston, are going to, are leading the way. We are going to have the biggest payroll to go to the moon. He meant to say payload. <laughs> rockets and slip. And he said, oh, well, it's a payroll, too, you know. And, uh, and that was the night before, last evening speech he gave was for Albert Thomas. Then he was up in uh, Fort Worth, Dallas. In that day, he was supposed to ride in the open car with a space hero, Gordon Cooper. And Cooper had been called last minute away from riding with Kennedy. Um, but they were supposed to go from the airport to where he got shot. They were on the way to the trademark, and Kennedy was giving a space speech. A uh, whole thing about how many satellites he had put up, how many successful missions, a whole uh, NASA spiel at the time he was killed. No, but, but Gordo never knows why he was called away for this. Um, this uh, by the time he was assassinated in 63, was the space program where it was supposed to be, or was it run behind? Or uh, It was doing exactly what it was supposed to do. James Webb, North Carolina, got it all funded. Webb was part of this Kerr-McGee Petroleum out of Oklahoma. And Kerr, as I said, was the senator with all these connections. This is big pork projects. Uh, Problem was that there were starting to be mutterings that we're spending too much, and that why race, why a decade, why can't it be 15 years, why 20, why this artificial by the end of the decade, why are we in this hurry up breakneck speed? It's going to lead to dead astronauts. 
the big thing is dead astronauts. We all, and you know, Apollo 1, um, Ed White and Roger Chafee and Gus Grissom all blew up on the launch pad in 1967. And then we thought the dead astronauts, there would be nothing worse for American prestige of having dead astronauts floating out in space. Um, but Kennedy's death, ironically, may have continued. I'm not sure we would have been able to keep funding it if Kennedy had had to play politics with it anymore. His death had became martyred. That let's fulfill Jack Kennedy's dream. And Jackie Kennedy comes and sees Lyndon and Lady Bird right after her husband's buried in Arlington and says, I have one favor, we've got to continue going on Jack's moon. That was his dream, and I want to make sure his dream's alive. Lyndon assures sure, her, yes, we will. And immediately, the first government memorial for Jack Kennedy is naming Cape Canaveral Kennedy Space Center. Then, whenever it gets sticky in Capitol Hill, and this isn't just Republicans, uh, Democrat, uh, Walter Mondale vigorously did not want to go to the moon, Senator of Minnesota. Um, William Fulbright didn't want to do it. And on the right, Barry Goldwater didn't want to do it. So there was dissent. It became a big Senate vote in 1966 where it was only four votes short of being defunded. So there was opposition, and the argument that developed was why waste all this money and going to the moon? What about Earth? What about schools? What about you know, uh, fighting the war on poverty, you know, uh, you know, there are other ways to use this money, but it hung in there. And Lyndon didn't abandon it. Nixon came in, and it's really funny, guys, <coughs> the correspondence I found from the Nixon Library, where you should see Bill Moyers, speechwriter for Lyndon Johnson, later great PBS man, uh, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, team up to convince Nixon to name the rocket to the moon the John F. Kennedy. And you should read the interner memos of Ehrlichman and Haldeman and these guys. Are you effing out of your mind? <laughs> oh, this is an ABC News stunt. This is there, and then one of them said, NBC's trying to get it called the John F. Kennedy. If you might as well rename the moon Kennedy then. And you know, they were all their internal memos going back of no. And when it called them and got to Nixon with like all these explanation points, tell them no. Enough Kennedy called them in words, enough Kennedyization of the moon. The reason Nixon didn't put smother himself all over Apollo 11, there was a 50-50 chance it wouldn't work. So he didn't want to be, he's a new president, he's in. If Apollo 11 went bad, he could say it was this, another, it's like Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson and Kennedy had crazed it all up. Uh, but once it was successful, he took full, 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 full you know, tribute of it. But even at that, after we went back to the moon, the ratings went down, he defunded, um, last, he canceled three Apollo missions, Nixon, he never, really was into it. By the end of the, by 1975, the United States goes with Russia together in a joint exercise to dock in space, and the space race is really over by 1975, and it's never captured the imagination of the public sense in that, in that kind of frenetic way. Well, you know, what you mentioned that the, the landing did trigger the argument that you'd hear for many years after that. If we can put a man on the moon, then why can't we or cancer, or why can't we in poverty? But actually, putting a man on the moon is probably easier than curing cancer and in poverty. We can go back to the moon right now. <laughs> in fact, Vice President Pence suggested it this past week. Technology's there. And this is primitive. If you want to, I mean, I know you've all gone to the Air and Space Museum, or most of you probably have in DC, and you've seen rockets and capsules. But there's something about Alan Shepard's capsule, which is now in the Kennedy Library in Boston. It is so tiny. It is so primitive. It's like this podium here, and he's like sitting like this, and the little equipment in there looks so retro. Like, uh, I mean, it's just a stunning that they were sh those guys were allowing themselves to be shot up in, in the air like that. Today, our technology is so much fuller. But once you're first on something, and this was always the problem Eisenhower had with going to the moon, which was an intellectual argument. I, 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 because we got to the moon, you know, Kennedy should get credit. He gambled and won. Uh, but it was a bit reckless. And Eisenhower said once, well, what happens once you go to the moon? 
We're not going to keep going. And so you did it, and now what? You're going to lose Why don't you build a more sustainable space program that keeps funding at a thing, but not do that great neck, bust the budget stuff. And um, But now we have people in the private sector wanting to eventually go. People like Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, or Elon Musk, or Branson, and all this. There's the sense of privatization of space. But, and then there are the Mars people. I think, though, our next big thing, and it'll probably come this summer, is the Trump administration. And maybe this, a Democratic president, if they win in 2020, will probably say we should go back to the moon because China is getting ready to go to the moon. And if China goes, it'll, we'll, we'll, it'll be like mud on our face and we'll be beat by China. Mm -hmm. And so I have a feeling. How will they have beaten us? Well, they're going to go on the dark side. Of oh, okay. <laughs> so is that a victory? That's true. They're going to go visit first time the dark side of the moon. Um, they're planning it in China, and so it's energizing. Problem with the problem with NASA, any government, is just funding, 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 funding. And, and a lot of people, what George Herbert Walker Bush said, will go to Mars, but the funding wasn't there to go to Mars. So I think we'll be back to the moon in my lifetime. Um, I don't think we'll be doing Mars. In your grandkids, or you know, a couple generations, Mars, but not, not, it's not there right now. But why go back to the moon? Um, as a platform for Mars, as a station, just like in the old days when you had Hawaii as a coaling station for steamers that were going to go to the Philippines and China trade in the 1890s, you would stop in Hawaii on your way to Asia as a place. It'll become building a facility there to then explore from that vantage point out further. But it's very expensive, and these, you're going to have to get a public consensus on things. And as you all know, the, the, the Kennedy era was a great era of bipartisanship. You know, he barely beat Nixon, deeply divided country, 60, and yet 60, 70 percent of the public would go along with Kennedy initiatives because he's our president. Let's do stuff. <coughs> The truth is Apollo, and I, I, I don't say this in my book because it's too primitive, but it is sort of the last World War II mobilization effort. You know, in World War II, we had the Manhattan Project and radar and all this. There was enough residue energy left for the space program like it was in World War II when we could, we're all in it together, we can get it done. And um, somewhere we lost that at, by the end of the Vietnam War, by, you know, um, the, the new suspicion of the federal government by 1980, the government's the problem, they're overtaxing you, they're ripping you off, the government becomes uh, uh, demonized. But in the 50s and 60s, the federal government was still seen as a good guy. Uh, Vietnam and perhaps Johnson bungling with some of the great society programs, Kissinger's lies, McNamara's lies. We can make a big list of why there became Pub Nixon himself. Uh, Watergate, it's public suspicion of the federal government. And uh, in order to Mars to go back to the moon, it needs a huge federal belief in the um, in U.S. taxpayer dollars, federal government, and now that's, there's just not a consensus with that. But by the time of his uh, assassination, Kennedy was pretty unpopular in the South, mostly because of, I guess, civil rights and the, and the South was in the process of changing from uh, being a Democrat to being a Republican. Do you think the possibility that had he not been assassinated that he may have lost support during that time? Yeah, and you know, one thing about Kennedy I kind of knew, but I've learned more on writing this book, is that he never, he hated losing. Now we can say, well, who doesn't? Nobody likes losing. I mean, he really hates losing. He never lost an election in his life. Probably overestimated as a statesperson, underestimated as a war politician. He won Congress in 1946. He won in 48. He won in 50. He then runs in 52 for the Senate and he wins. He runs in 1958 for the Senate and wins. He runs for president and wins. He's a winner. And uh, in fact, he's playing chess with Kenny O'Donnell, his uh, Ken O'Donnell, one of his one of his aides, and. O'Donnell has about to have him checkmated. And Kennedy notices that I'm about to be checkmated and topples the whole table <laughs> and says, I guess Kenny will never know who won. <laughs> and it's funny, but he, it, it, he's wired like that, guys. <laughs> That's his wi internal wiring. Um, 
and it belies the notion because he's seen sailing and playing with his kids and his tan and he's, he seems kind of like this feel good uh, debonair guy but the, the inner being of him is all all spine backbone um, you know he was just uh, and maybe his illness was part of it uh, um, that he some people think he had thought he wasn't going to live long so was living part of it was World War II uh, the PT-109 was real. He, his boat got blown up. Some of the guys under his command died. He got injuries. He had to tie one of the um, crewmates on his back and swim to an island with him to save them in shark-infested waters. And, I mean, we can hype it up a little, PT-109. But anyway, he, he saw death. And when you see death all around you, you look at the shortness of life and you, you operate uh, accordingly. Kennedy was a big believer in global prestige. That's why he'd hate our times right now. He, he, I, there are arguments whether it matters or not, but he wanted the world to love America. And he thought global prestige mattered. So when Glenn went around, they took his capsule, the Friendship 7 went all over the world. He became Goodwill Ambassador, promotion of American science and technology and American marvels, and um, winning hearts and minds with the Peace Corps, or whatever it was for Kennedy. He wanted America to be seen and loved by the rest of the world as the exceptional country. Uh, that's different than a kind of nativist, uh, um, you know, America first mentality. Yeah. Well, we go to questions in just a moment. Let me just, by way of closing this point, let me ask you to go back to that night when the Apollo 11 landed and you're watching, and I assume you're watching crime crisis. What do you thought of that moment of landing? I, I remember it. Every black and white flicker of it, I remember the TV watching this. I remember just feeling what was, uh, um, that I was witnessing the most extraordinary thing. What I didn't know at the time was it may have been the biggest historic thing of my life um, I, as an event. I, I, there are trends that are bigger. I mean, maybe discovering DNA is larger or, um, you know, the, um, the mic creation of the microchip or, you know, I don't know from the larger suite medical miracles that we have today, longevity in our, our lives and all that. But for just an event, of the fact that they, there they were standing on the moon and we're watching them in real time. And to think in 1962, when Kennedy put up the satellite Telstar, General Electric, we, when he spoke, that we showed images of Buffalo on the Great Plains that were wired, satellited to um, Europe. First time you had transcontinental satellite imagery going back and forth for telecommunication satellites. Later creates the cable news world. But, the, but so from 60, we never had that ability in 62, and now we're broadcasting from the moon to 550 million people all over the world. The key is television is a big player in the 1960s. Today we have our, 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 our internet, our laptop, and, and, and the like, social media. But TV was the king, and space and TV were married as surely as anything, because it allowed to bring the moon and this American feet right into our living rooms. How, how old were you? I was nine, almost nine. OK, let's go to the questions. Uh, Peggy, the next one. Well, Werner von Braun, big dream was really Moon was second to him. He wanted to go to Mars in his lifetime. Um, and we started looking up, can, can we go all the way to Mars? And so we started developing it and the program got abandoned in the 50s. Some of the technology out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech, um, now Caltech's doing the Mars rover and all of that. They began, they kept, California became the Mars people. And, um, and so, but it never got to the next stages. Uh, it's, uh, they, the public, I can't tell you about public fallout after we went to the moon. The public interest started declining to the point, and then we had the space shuttle disaster. I write in my book about women in space and how these were all white men that went to the moon. Five, you had to be under 5'10". 
There were 13 women trained to be astronauts in the early 60s. There we call them the Mercury 13. They were given exams by Dr. Randy Lovelace, all of the same endurance tests that the men, and they passed all of them. Uh, but, in the, but Kennedy and John Glenn and others shot it down that they did not have time to do new gender, um, um, they, they wanted people with a combat test pilot um, background, and the women were kept out in the Korean War, they obviously couldn't, we didn't qualify, but I think it was a mistake not putting a, a, a woman in during the Kennedy years, um, because the Soviets beat us with the first woman in space. We had to wait till Sally Ride. Um, Edward R. Murrow wanted a dark-skinned person, and particularly an African-American, but if it was an Indo-American or something, um, he thought that would send a greater public relations message, since most of the world's not white, and America put an African-American astronaut in the space. Murrow lobbied hard for that, and, and he didn't get it. Um, only now, in our age, is NASA and our astronaut corps deeply diverse. <coughs> It's a very hot field for women. And you, um, my wife, Ann, and I spoke at University of Pittsburgh, and I was on the platform um, for the woman who was the first spacewalker, and the first woman to walk in space. Um, she now lives in Columbus. So you know, there are a lot of firsts with women in space. I say that for young, next generation, a lot of women are getting involved with um, uh, space. And space, guys, is very popular in college campuses. It really is. There are all sorts of money going into science, technology, and young people find it deeply interesting space exploration. It's not a burned out field of inquiry, uh, far from it. It's, um, I always thought, because I've been teaching since my days here at Eisenhower Center at UNO, I teach a class on the 60s and 70s, and when I started, the counterculture was really popular. Frank Zappa or the Rolling Stones and you know Woodstock and LSD and Tim Leary and Ken Kesey and nobody cares about that stuff. <laughs> they all care about going to the moon. They care about space exploration. Uh, uh, it's what the big takeaway of the 60s. There's some people from the 60s that are sustainable. <coughs> Beyond the, some of the civil rights people, certainly Martin Luther King and John Lewis and. Uh, Cesar Chavez, to some degree, is sustainable with his protest. Some of Gloria Steinem and some of the women's movement stuff. But the interest in space is, um, is, is actuated right now. So so there's a couple of questions, Aaron, and then you uh, I know it's a small word, but it might be a, a giant question to the story. I understand that somebody who talked that, uh, obviously, uh, to, uh, you know, It's not there when you listen. Right. Um, but um, so if it's a writer, it's a literary festival. I don't hear the A, so you put the A in a, in a, in a bracket, um, parentheses, to let people know that he may not have said that. He says he said it, and it just got dropped from the communications. So he, uh, who knows? Wait, 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 let's go right here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, originally, no, it was meant to be there. The question is, did he accidentally bobble it or not? Okay, let's go. Yes, ma'am. Just as a historian, do you have any credence over all of these conspiracy theories with Kennedy's death? I mean, do you find the evidence that it was solved? Oh, Kennedy assassination, if I could solve it, I'd be really famous. <laughs> um, and and um, it, it's hard. I've looked into a lot. It's a field of endeavor. You better be careful when you enter because it takes you down all sorts of strange avenues. And I've, I've dabbled. Uh, and I've gotten myself out because I realized you have to sink almost your whole career uh, into that. Um, but maybe in the spirit of what we're talking about, the moon conspiracy is big too. All over people think we did not go to the moon, that it was staged in a Hollywood studio, that the evidence is that that American flag, there's no wind, so how can it be standing stiff like that, not realizing that they had, had unfurled it in with a kind of a, a um, uh, wire so it would stay out like that. Um, the, um, and it's widespread. 70% of the people that live in Russia believe we never went to the moon. 70% of Russians 
believe we never went to the moon. I went down to Venezuela. I had a press credential for CBS News, and incidentally, I went with the actor Sean Penn, who had a credential from The Nation, and Christopher Hitchens, who had a one from Vanity Fair. And the three of us flew down, and we interviewed Hugo Chavez. And Sean Penn liked Hugo Chavez, like he was a Che Guevara-like figure, Hollywood of the left. And Hitchens was a neocon and loathed him. Okay, so I had both of them. And I thought, well, my role is to be, give the guy a chance, hear him out, be the middle center person. Well, uh, I, he was, he lost me. Because although he was funny, charismatic, he would go Chavez at one point. He said, well, you know, America never went to the moon. I said, what? He said, oh, the whole thing was fake. That was all. You know, you must know that that thing's never. And I and continued to pursue it. I said, I'm from Ohio. I was starting to get offended. You know, Neil Armstrong, I interviewed Neil Armstrong, you know. No, 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 no. He, he, they just believe it, that it never happened. It's much more widespread than you think. It's not 5% of the world or 10%. It's high percentages of conspiracy theories going on about it. So, both the Kennedy assassination and going to the moon are very, um, very right with um, conspiracy theories.